My name's Peter Hughes, uh, as you can see on the screen. Um, I, what I want to do tonight is actually tell you a little bit about my story and hopefully that will help you. If you're uh, one of the people who are struggling with a mental illness uh, tonight, then I hope this is going to be helpful for you to learn how you can tell your story. And uh, if you know someone who has a mental illness, this may be helpful for you to work out how to have that conversation with them. Uh, there are three things I'd like you to know about me uh, as I tell you this story. Uh, the first is, yes, I do have a degree in uh, psychology, uh, in neuropsychology. Uh, it just happens that I, it's a very similar field to what Dr Kim uh, works in. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about that tonight because I would feel like a high school physics teacher trying to explain physics when Stephen Hawking is in the room. So uh, I'm not really going to say anything at that point. Um, the second thing, though, is that I, um, I work in Christian ministry and I've worked in professional Christian ministry for about 18 years now, uh, in a range of different things, working with different people. Uh, that means, yes, I do have a Christian worldview. I identify as a Christian. Um, and the third thing I'd like you to know about me is that uh, for all of my adult life, I have struggled with a bipolar depression disorder. Uh, and I want to talk to you about what that has been like for me. Uh, now, one of the things about mental illness is that everyone's experience will be slightly different. Uh, and so it's important that we learn to tell our stories. Uh, people will have similar disorders to what I have, uh, but it will be a different experience of what that disorder is like. Uh, as it is, my uh, disorder comes from, it's, I've got a genetic predisposition to it from my mother's side of the family. Uh, I just happen to get it worse than everybody else, apparently. Uh, and um, uh, what it means for me is I have a, a couple of weeks uh, each year, uh, several times through the year, where I go through uh, periods of depression, periods of low, uh, where it, it, things are a little hard for me. I also have some uh, manic periods where things are really, really good, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But um, what, it, uh, what that means for, for me, I'm actually quite lucky if you're going to go with something like, if you're going to have a disorder like this, uh, it doesn't um, incapacitate me too much. So uh, I know other people that I've talked to and dealt with for whom it's been quite um, incapacitating in their life. So in the, in the scheme of things, I'm actually pretty okay in, that, uh, in, in what you're going to get dealt. But it is something I've had all of my adult life and probably will have for most of my adult life. Uh, where this happened was, I, I noticed when I was growing up as an uh, adolescent, I'd go through these bouts of feeling uh, like, you know, very heavy, there's a weight on me, I uh, wasn't sleeping particularly well, uh, I felt really um, emotionally and mentally foggy. Now, I just assumed that that was adolescence, right? Because we all, I mean, we all go through those angsty adolescent kind of times, don't we? Uh, and so I just thought, oh, that's just what growing up it was like. By the time I got to university, looking back now, uh, by the time I got to university, um, I was uh, struggling with some of the things that Dr Kim mentioned about um, alcohol abuse in lectures, uh, and I was basically self-medicating using alcohol. Uh, and so what I, when I went to lectures, I wasn't particularly um, sober, and uh, exams meant, because uh, I was sober, I didn't do particularly well. But... Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I managed to get through university, but uh, drinking had become a problem, and some of the things that happened because of that was also a problem for me. I had a friend who came to me and said, oh, look, I, I think you actually have a problem. I think, and I you know, mentioned I go through these kind of different uh, episodes. And she said, look, I think you've got a problem. I think you need to go and see someone. And so I went and saw the university uh, psychologist, not because I thought I had a problem, I just wanted to prove her wrong. And so I went and saw a psychologist. The psychologist very quickly uh, diagnosed me with uh, what is now recognised as a high-frequency bipolar cycle. Uh, and so uh, I then, uh, it took me actually a couple of months to kind of get my head around what that meant and that I was someone who had a mental illness. Uh, but um, I then went on to try and find some, some help with that. I was sent to a number of different uh, psychiatrists. Uh, we tried different forms of medication. Uh, now, let me just say a quick thing about medication and mental health and medication. Um, some people have a stigma about that in that they go, oh, I, don't want to, I don't want to take drugs because that's just, you know, it's, it feels weird. I don't want to be dependent upon them. Uh, but actually, um, medication for mental health can be very, very helpful. 
Uh, and so I, I would, I'd, if you are in that position right now, I really want to encourage you and your mental health professional is encouraging you to take medication. It can be actually very helpful for your treatment. However, uh, keep in mind that mental health medication doesn't work like Nurofen. Uh, you know, Nurofen, you take, a, you take something and five minutes later the headache's gone and you're all okay. A lot of mental health medication takes weeks and weeks uh, sometimes to build up uh, to be working in your system. And so that means you need to be patient as that works up. But the flip side is also important. So that means that if you're taking medication and the treatment's working and you're working with your med, uh, mental health professional and you kind of, I think things are turning around, I feel, feel pretty good, you can stop taking your medication and still feel okay for a day. In fact, you can stop taking it for even a week and still feel okay, but then you will crash very badly soon after. So if you, what I want to advise you is if you are taking mental health medication, please make sure you are talking to your mental health professional through that whole process and don't just come off it yourself. It's a, it's a very, it can be a very dangerous thing. But for me, uh, the medication didn't really work. Uh, actually, ended up making me quite sick. And so I've actually had to learn uh, a whole bunch of management techniques uh, in, in dealing with things. Uh, for example, I learned to plan ahead. Um, I do a reasonable amount of public speaking, so I, I write my talks several weeks ahead so that if I am in a mental fog, I can still deliver OK, but I can't write very well. So I, I plan things out. Uh, I make sure that I'm not making decisions when I'm going through uh, a very uh, a bad bout. I mean, when you are feeling like uh, the whole world is crushing down on you, that is not a good time to make a career decision, for example. Um, I have a wonderful wife who helps me through all of this. Uh, I also make sure that I avoid certain things that are going to be particularly unhelpful for me during those various bouts. Uh, they may make me feel normal for a little bit, but then I will crash very badly after it. Alcohol is obviously one I've already mentioned, uh, but the other two ones I've, I'm very careful of when I'm going through a, a bout of depression are caffeine and sugar, um, which get contained in Coca-Cola. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like, so uh, I, I'm very cautious about, I actually don't drink Coke anymore, but I'm very careful about doing that because I, you know, you, you, you drink a number of coffees, you're feeling really great for about, I don't know, 20 minutes, and then after that, everything just comes crashing down. So I'm very careful about that as well. Of course, it's not just the illness itself that I have to deal with. Uh, there's also the stigma that's attached to mental health, and that's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk tonight. Uh, I've had um, various people, uh, as I've talked with people about this, in fact, when I first was diagnosed, I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want people to know. Uh, but as I've revealed this to different people, uh, some people have reacted very well and very helpfully. Other people have been less so, but I don't think that's because they're being particularly malicious. I just don't know that they know how to have the conversation. That being said, it was interesting, actually, as I was... I, I've been speaking about this actually now for several years, but it was only really as I prepared for this talk that I realised I still struggle with my own stigma of having to stand up and say, I have a mental illness. And uh, in fact, I, I hate doing these sort of talks, but I think they're important to do. And so I can see that I'm still dealing with it myself. But the only way that we can really deal with this kind of stigma is if we do sit and talk about this. So like I said, I want to encourage you to learn to be able to talk with each other about what is going on. We've talked about a lot of the negative things that happen with uh, mental illness, particularly in my experience. But um, in some disorders, and uh, some disabilities, there can be advantages. Uh, for example, there's been several studies that have been done by uh, about entrepreneurs who, uh, particularly in the electronic, the dot-com kind of um, industry, uh, in, that, in that kind of little community of entrepreneurs, there is a, um, a larger proportion of people with dyslexia than the general community. And uh, people have actually looked at those studies. They've even sat down and talked with these guys and girls about, you know, how does your dyslexia affect your role as an entrepreneur? And a number of these entrepreneurs, maybe it's because they're entrepreneurs, I don't know, but a lot of these entrepreneurs actually see this as an advantage rather than a disadvantage. Because they say, I can't, we're not very good at reading and writing, and that forces us to network and be relational. And because of that relation, uh, relationality, we actually have an advantage over some of the other guys who are relying on their written uh, presentations and their reports. 
I don't know whether that's true, and I don't know whether that's a helpful thing uh, for those of you who are struggling with dyslexia. But for me, are there any advantages for me? Uh, well, there's three, really. Uh, one is, yeah, I actually, I, I don't get it as much anymore as I've got older, but occasionally I do get, still get the mania kind of things of episodes where I get about two or three days where I feel great and I get a lot of work done. I know for some people who have manic um, episodes, it actually, uh, they, they make decisions that are very erratic and very unhelpful. Fortunately, I'm not in that category. I actually, I, I get lots of stuff done. I'm really creative. I get, you know, it, it's a wonderful kind of couple of days for me, keeping in mind that I know that usually there's a depressive cycle right behind it as well, though. Uh, so that's the first thing. Yeah, I occasionally still get the manic cycles, which are good for me. Uh, I, um, it has also enabled me to be probably a little more emotionally resilient. I work as a church pastor at the moment uh, in the Anglican church. Uh, I often see people on their best day and I sometimes see people on their worst day and it is an emotional roller coaster. Uh, and for uh, a lot of people, I mean, I can mention that I had two appointments today. Both were very, very difficult um, conversations that I had to have with people. Uh, and people sometimes ask, how do you survive getting through that? And I'm going, well, actually, as hard as these things are, the things that I go through with my cycle have actually taught me that I, I've learned to become emotionally resilient through that whole process. Uh, and the third thing that uh, advantage that I have is that I actually get to talk to people who have the same sort of issues that I have. And I can talk with them going, I know, because I do know. And I don't know everyone's personal experience, but yes, I have my story and you have your story and we can share that story together. Now, I've talked a little bit about my experience, um, but I want to ask the question or come back to the issue of how does this work in terms of my Christian uh, worldview, my Christian understanding of things? Um, now, I, I realise that not everyone here is Christian. You may have been invited along tonight by a friend. Um, I'm not asking you to accept my Christian worldview uh, tonight. What I want to do is I want to explain it to you so that you can understand me a little bit better because it's uh, key to understanding who I am and how I deal with the, uh, the issues that I do. And I want to explain it a little bit because I, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding in Australian culture as to what the Christian message is or Christian worldview is. I think it's either a case of um, uh, Christianity is about everyone should love one another, you know, the golden rule, treat each other as you should treat your, yourself, that kind of thing. Or it's, um, he, there's a bunch of moral rules and if you, you know, follow the moral rules, you get to look down on everyone who didn't follow the moral rules. Um, I don't know if you've seen, the, if you're on Netflix, the Netflix series, The Good Place, uh, kind of combines those two things together. And uh, I, if you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's a very fun, just watch it for Ted Danson because uh, he's hilarious in it. He plays the opposite of Becker. But uh, it's, it, it, that's the kind of misunderstanding of what the Christian worldview is. And actually, it's not like that at all. Let me very briefly touch on a few key things. Uh, Christian worldview says that the world isn't the way it should be. Uh, and the reason for that is partly because we don't do the things that we should do. Uh, there are things that I did when I was self-medicating on alcohol, uh, things I still do now, but things that I did then that I'm ashamed of that I shouldn't have done that, that didn't treat people the right way. And so there's what we do. And then secondly, there is the, the fact that we live in a world of people who don't do what we should be doing. And sometimes we become the victims of what they have done to us. And then thirdly, there is also, for some reason, and I've never quite understood this, to be honest, but uh, what we have done as a humanity, uh, to the, according to the Christian worldview, has affected the very fabric of the universe. And so my genetics isn't quite what it should be, and so I have a genetic predisposition to uh, a um, cyclic depression disorder. That's what I've uh, been dealt with. But... Christian worldview also goes on to say that God has not left that alone, but he has sent his son, Jesus. Jesus enables us to be adopted into God's family and being seen as a child of God, not because of anything we've done, but because of uh, the status that has been given to us. Now, that helps me in, my, in, in the mental health issues in four ways. The first is it enables me to be able to say it's okay not to be okay. 
uh, that, that's pretty much what the worldview is saying, is saying, actually, the world isn't the way it is. It should be. We're not the way we should be. And it's OK for me to stand up and to deal with the stigma that I have about myself and the stigma that we have about mental health and say, actually, that's the truth of it. And so it is OK to not be OK and to admit that it's OK not to be OK. And because I still have a status of being a, a, ch a child of God, I, this, this doesn't affect that at all. The second thing is it enables me to deal with some of those things that I'm ashamed of, that I did badly, that I actually still do badly. Um, and it enables me to say, I find forgiveness in that worldview, in through what Jesus has done. Uh, thirdly, um, it enables me to uh, understand who my identity is. You see, one of the things about mental health is it can be very overwhelming. You can say, I am... I'm someone who's depressed. I, I, have, I am someone who has bipolar. I am a, a sufferer of bipolar. But actually, the way that I think of myself is I am an adopted child of God who happens to have bipolar. Right? It is very important because our identity actually drives how we live, how we see ourselves. And so I can actually say, well, actually, that's not the key part of my identity. My identity has been given to me by God. And the fourth thing is that God has given me the hope that one day I won't have to deal with this. Now, could God take this away from me? Yeah. Have I asked him to? Oh, yeah. Uh, has he? No. But he has promised there will be a time when I will leave it, that I will continue to be a child of God, but not have to deal with the bipolar. That helps me enormously in the way that I deal with my uh, mental health issues. Like I said, you may not agree with the worldview that I've presented, but I wanted you to know that's part of my story. Now, I hope that tonight that you've been able to understand a little bit about how... I, I won't, firstly, I want you to understand my story. I hope that that's been helpful for you. And I hope that if you're somebody here tonight uh, who needs to hear a story like that, you can kind of go, OK, I now understand what that is like. And I understand that everyone's experience is slightly different. Uh, I hope that you, uh, if you have someone, if you're someone here tonight who has a mental illness, that this will give you a little more courage to speak a little more boldly about it and that together we can deal with the stigma. But if you are someone who wants to have that conversation, let me end by giving you a couple of uh, suggestions as to how this might work. Uh, if, you, if you know someone, you know, someone's you know, raised some issues, you, go, I, you know, I've had some anxiety or I, you know, I've, I've been feeling depressed, I've had to have some time off because I'm depressed or some other little uh, thing that, that waves a flag to say, actually, there's something going on here. Uh, what you want to do is to sit them down and have a, the, the kind of conversation you have might look like this. You might want to say, can I talk to you uh, about your mental health things. I noticed that you've said this. Do you mind if I talk to you about this? Ask their permission. Obviously, if they say no, end the conversation. Uh, if they say yes, then you have a permission to go on. They may well say, look, I do want to talk about it, but I'm really not in a good place to do it right now. In which case, you do need to come back to that. The second thing that you want to ask is, how does this affect you? And so tonight, I've explained some of the ways it affects me and how I deal with it. And you may want to ask them, how does it affect you? Now, as that happens, the key thing here for you is to listen. One of the things I know, uh, when you see someone that you know, and particularly if it's someone that's close to you, someone you love, the thing that you'll, you will instinctively want to do is you want to fix it. And there are things that you won't be able to do in terms of fixing it. You just need to listen. And so uh, one of the things that, for those of us who have this conversation, one of the things that drives us nuts, and I'll say that on our, everyone else's behalf, when you sit there and kind of go, have you tried this or have you thought about doing this? Uh, yeah, you know what? We have. Like, we, we, we don't like being where we are, and we have tried all of those different things. You don't need to go back through that again. Uh, but what we'd rather do, what you do, is just listen to what's going on rather than give us lots of solutions. Uh, finally, the, qu the other question that you may want to ask at the end is, uh, are there things that, that you, if, if I was having the conversation, is there, are there things that I can do that's going to help you? Or are there things that I'm doing now that are, going to, are actually causing you pain or are not being helpful at all? Um, I know for me, for example, uh, I had a friend who asked me this and said, uh, you know, what can I do while you're going through a cycle? And I said, now, it's going to be different for different people. Uh, and for me, for example, the thing that helps me most is if you just treat me like everything is normal, I kind of feel like 
there is some no normality to life and I can kind of see a little bit of hope there. And so I said, just treat me like everything is normal and that will be the best thing for me. Now, that's going to be different for, like, as I said, uh, if you have a friend, they may have a different answer to that. Uh, alternatively, they also may have um, different answers to, uh, if they are someone who has a Christian perspective, they have uh, a different answers to some of those things that I've mentioned here tonight. But I hope tonight has been helpful for you to hear a story, to understand how to tell a story and how to ask someone about that story. Uh, I also hope that um, this has given perhaps some of you an idea that where the Christian worldview and who Jesus is may actually fit into that story and help that story. But uh, I want to say thank you very much for listening to my story. Thank you.